What's up guys? Welcome to Beyond Transmission. My name is Trevor Hagen and today we are actually in my hometown of Salt Lake City, Utah. And this weekend it's actually been quite a winter wonderland outside. Anyway, before we get started into one of the most ancient religions that still exists today, we might ask ourselves why talk about all of these religions? Um, you know, haven't they been lost for a reason? You know, why study Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity even, if what I have is already truth and I've confirmed it within myself, then isn't seeking anything outside of that merely a waste of time or just entertainment at best? Also, there have been much smarter people than have come before me that have already kind of figured out all of these things and narrowed it down to what is most correct. And I'd rather trust them than my puny brain. Well, if any of that deceit or ego is present within your mind, then it might be best to remind ourselves that although we do have seemingly infinite knowledge at our fingertips and many brilliant and enlightened individuals that have come before us, we are just now coming out of the dark age. A time where humankind has been asleep now for the past couple thousand years and there have been civilizations before us that were much more enlightened, much more advanced, and awake to the truths that we can now find within these ancient religions. In fact, the further you dig back, the more you realize that we are just now starting to figure it all out again. How is it that the book of Genesis, for example, was already written by the Sumerians a few hundred years before Moses was even born? How about the Vedas, that they contain the secrets of the universe long before Buddha, Jesus Christ existed, or even the invention of the telescope itself? How did the Egyptians erect the Sphinx and the pyramids some 4,000 plus years ago with such precise detail and symbolism? And what did these symbols within them mean? You see, this is not a time for assumptions or to shut ourselves off to possibilities. If anything, this is a time for us to begin exploring again what we once knew. What I love about studying religion is that each and every religion carries within it, and even though sometimes it's deep through, you gotta uncover the mythology and the stories that are used to illustrate these truths, there are seeds of a common story and a common truth that unites not just all religions, but all of us as human beings. And the great thing about learning about other cultures and their stories is that you never know what story is going to resonate certain truths more effectively to your inner self. Maybe even some more effectively than those that you were born into. So with that said, what the heck is Zoroastrianism? I first heard about Zoro Zoroastrianism when I read a short story by a Mormon author called A Short Stay in Hell, which is a super fun read. It's fiction, and although it doesn't go into too much uh, detail into uh, Zoroastrianism itself, it got me interested enough uh, to really look into the religion. And it turns out Zoroastrianism was founded 3,500 years ago in the Bronze Age by an Iranian prophet by the name of Zoroaster. And it was actually one of the very first movements away from polytheism to monotheism. And it's thought to have paved the way for modern day Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So in other words, prior to Zoroaster, most people believed in worshiping multiple gods instead of one supreme being. And now today there are less than 200,000 existing members of this dying religion. And they mostly reside in India and Iran. But it's crazy to think that this movement began over a thousand years before Buddha, before Jesus Christ, but the teachings are very familiar. And thus we see belief cycles that ripple throughout religious history. Zoroastrianism exalts a single deity of wisdom by the name of Ahura Mazda as its supreme being. Ahura means being and Mazda means mind. But this is all a based in language. And Zoroaster keeps the two attributes um, separate, actually. It's two different concepts in most of the Gathas, which is scripture uh, to Zoroastrianism, we'll, but we'll come back to that here in just a second. And it also consciously uses a masculine word for one concept and, and a feminine for the other, as if to 
distract from an anthropomorphism of Aura Mazda's divinity and also the androgynous nature of God. To dive a little bit deeper on that, anthropomorphism means the idea that God is limited to one physical body exactly like us and androgynous like the word Elohim for God. And Elohim's definition being masculine, El, feminine, O, and Im implying that it's also plural. So multiple female and male energies, you could say, um, or deities that exist in one supreme power. What makes Zoroastrianism so unique, though, is that it combined cosmogonic dualism with etchological monotheism. What does that mean? Well, let me put it this way. Post-Zoroastrianism is one of the first religions to birth the idea of a devil figure. That's right, it all came from Zoroastrianism. And, it, and the devil figure was originally known as Angra Mainyu. But that good and evil only exist internally within one's own mind. So the war waged between good and evil is a constant war that exists within us instead of so much outside of us. And it's a, a daily fight that we go through, striving for the good to overcome the evil. Now, the polarity within Zoroastrianism is the ever-present truth and order known as Asha and chaos and disorder called Drudge that coexist and eternally oppose each other, kind of like left and right brain. Okay, now follow me on this one. Since Zoroastrianism's divinity covers both being and mind, as immanent entities, it's better described as a belief in an immanent self-creating universe with consciousness, thereby putting Zoroastrianism in the pantheistic fold where it can easily be traced to its shared origin with Indian Brahmanism, as we can see to, in, in modern day Hinduism. Now, the most important texts of the religion are those of the Avesta, which include the writings of Zoroaster, known as the Gathas that we talked about earlier, which are enigmatic poems or hymns that define the religion's precepts in scripture. There's no particular meeting house uh, for Zoroastrianism uh, where it's practiced, although they do have fire temples where group worship is practiced every so often. The fire in the temples represents the eternal and constant flame of life and is considered a medium through which spiritual insight and wisdom is gained. Now, universally speaking, the element of fire is our inner light as well as a living symbol of the divine fire that burns in every soul. Again, so many truths that are, that are woven and emphasized in different ways through so many different religions. In Zoroastrianism, the purpose of life is to be among those who renew the world, to make the world progress towards perfection. This is attained by good thoughts, good words, and then good deeds. And realizing that by taking good action, good rewards naturally flow back to you. Man, there's just so much commonality that we can see here, both in Western religion and Eastern religion that stemmed from these ideas. Another interesting fact about Zoroastrianism is the way that they handle their dead. Instead of a traditional burial or cremation, they instead prefer to leave their bodies out in the open desert to be consumed by the fowls of the air. This is supposedly a physical way of separating the decay from creation itself. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a religion facing distinction. And mostly because of the precepts it teaches go against any form of growth. And in fact, it's a miracle to me that it even exists today since you actually cannot be converted to Zoroastrianism. You can't decide to convert and get baptized, for example, and now you're part of the religion. You are only, you're either born into it or not. And those that are born into it are commanded to only marry others within the same religion. So you could see how this could stint growth. If they marry outside of religion, they're actually no longer considered to be part of it and their families and friends within the religion um, treat them as an outcast. Because of this, many believe that we might actually see the absolute distinction of this religion within our lifetime. Now, Zoroaster's ideas of ethical monotheism, heaven, hell, resurrection, and even the Messiah figure were once so expansive and so popular and now 
Hardly anyone even recognizes or has even heard of Zoroastrianism. But yet they've had such a major impact on today's modern religions that it's easy to conceive of a time in the future when humankind will experience the distinction of other major religions that are so expansive and, and popular today, like Judaism, Islam, and yes, even Christianity, as they will be replaced over time with newer messiahs and more popular newer religions as the cycle of religion continues throughout time. Anyway, with that said, I hope you enjoyed this brief overview of Zoroastrianism and how it has stemmed so many different religions that we see today. If you liked this video, please subscribe and feel free to leave any comments or questions below. If these videos do nothing else, I really hope they inspire you to stay curious because everything within and outside of us is just too big to assume that anything is for certain. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you next time. Oh